good afternoon so uh, welcome to this talk as a part of the uh, gw at home series um today i will be giving you an overview of the observatories in uh, india and uh, you know because this is a gravitational wave series let me just also uh, before going on to the overview of the observatories in india let me give you a connect between the observatories and the gravitational waves so what is it that we would like to observe with these indian observatories it is essentially looking for the electromagnetic counterparts of the gravitational wave sources and why do we do want to do that because the electromagnetic observations will help us understand about the nature of the gravitational source whether they are black hole events or black hole uh, neutron star events or binary neutron star or is it the collapse of a white dwarf or a collapse of a massive star it will also help us in pinning down the positions of the sources because as we know the gravitational uh, wave detectors uh, the localization of the source with these detectors is not so great so the electromagnetic observations help you in pinning down the position of the sources in addition they will help us in identifying the host galaxy that is the galaxy in which the event has occurred and the local environment in the host galaxy so to do this we actually need a suite of telescopes and instruments which are not located in one particular place but spread across the globe and we also need observations in the over the entire electromagnetic range ranging all the way from the gamma rays to x rays the ultraviolet to the radio and in a variety of modes of observations so obviously this kind of requires international collaboration it requires the use of uh, several observatories so um, and and it also requires long term uh, monitoring deep observations and long term monitoring so how does india fit into this see we are very uniquely located um as we can see here in this um map over here what is shown here all these dots that you see here they are the locations of various telescopes of different sizes and as you can see india is uniquely located longitudinally between the telescopes on the eastern side and the telescopes on the western side so when we want to observe these objects which are called as the transients it is important to have a, a coverage in time as much as we can and using the observatories across the globe will help us get an almost 24 hour coverage of these objects now why do we need a 24 hour coverage of these objects because they are transients which means that they are changing their physical property rapidly with respect to time so it is extremely important to monitor them get what we call as a time resolved observations of this so this is where india is very uniquely uh, positioned now before i go over to the actual you know description of the observatories and the facilities we have in the country let me just say a few words about astronomical observatory itself in general and something about the telescopes so what is an uh, what are the essential components in an astronomical observatory obviously the telescope now what do the telescopes do they collect radiation um in the radio region we use reflectors and antenna whereas in the optical uh, infrared and ultraviolet we use mirrors or a polished reflector in the x rays and gamma rays there are special mirrors that are used and for high energy gamma rays we use the cherenkov radiation in the atmosphere so these are some of the uh, varieties of telescopes and techniques that are adopted and then we need instruments which actually analyze the radiation so there are different kinds of instruments that we can use one is to just get the uh, the intensity of the source or to study its polarization or to study the spectrum that is spectroscopic observations and of course we need detectors that will record this um, radiation that we are receiving and analyze them 
Observatories are located at remote sites and the optical infrared observatories are, in addition to being at remote sites, they're also located at high altitude sites. So why do we need a high altitude remote site? Basically, one of the main reasons is to avoid man-made interference. And the other reason is also to reduce the effects of our own atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere. So what are the man-made interference? And obviously for an optical telescope, it is a night sky um, emission. And uh, you know the, the, the light pollution is higher in a place which is more densely populated and which obviously is high in the more advanced uh, regions. So this is a map showing the night sky emission that is from man-made uh, light sources. So one can call it as a light pollution across the globe. And as you can see that you know there are places which are really dark, but these are the nice remote places. And it is some of these locations where the observatories are also uh, sited. And um, what about the Earth's atmosphere? The Earth's atmosphere will absorb light that we know. There's minimal absorption in the radio and in the optical region. And we also see that the transmission of the atmosphere improves with altitude, as is shown in this cartoon here. So um, what the atmosphere is actually doing is it is scattering the light which is incident on it, in addition to absorbing the light in certain wave bands. It also emits in select lights and bands. So we need to um, be in a location where the Earth's uh, atmosphere, the interference due to the Earth's atmosphere is minimal. In addition, the Earth's atmosphere is turbulent. And this turbulence distorts the images of the objects that is formed through it. So it, the, the light coming from the, the star, because of the turbulence, is, uh, is distorted in a certain sense. And we need to go to a site which has lower turbulence. So high altitude sites are generally found to have low atmospheric turbulence. So this you know, shows us that we need a remote site where the light pollution is less or man-made interferences are less. You go to a high altitude site so that you have low atmospheric interference too. So this essentially takes us to some of the most remote locations and some of the best locations on Earth. Um, just a few um, slides on the optical telescopes, a, a very general overview. So what do these optical telescopes do? They gather light and then they focus light from celestial objects for us to see. They um, help in magnifying the distant objects. That is essentially, they increase the apparent angular size of these objects. And the telescopes are generally a combination of lenses or a combination of mirrors. The ones which are a combination of lenses are called the refracting telescopes and the ones with a combination of mirrors are called as the reflecting telescopes. The modern day telescopes are all reflecting telescopes. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the larger is the aperture, the more is the light gathering power. So in fact, the light gathering power goes as the square of the diameter of the, the primary mirror, which is the main um, light gathering source in a telescope. And also the larger the aperture, the better is the resolving part, which is defined by this very simple um, equation here. So this is just a cartoon of the telescope as a light collector. Um, you basically have a primary mirror, which is receiving light from these distant objects. And this light is reflected on from the primary mirror to the focus. Now, what is normally done is that in the path of this converging light, there is another mirror located, which is called as a secondary mirror, which essentially diverts the light 
on to a place which is behind the primary mirror and called as a cassegrain focus another configuration that you can have is that you have a third mirror after the secondary which is called as a tertiary mirror which deflects the light from um behind the primary as in the case of cassegrain focus as opposed to that this deflects the light to the side and this focus is called as a nasmith focus so this is how uh, very generically a telescope is gathering the the light and to uh, beat the atmospheric turbulence we adapt the techniques called the adaptive optics so what this is doing is that it is um here in this uh, movie what you're seeing is that the, the distorted image as the light is passing through the atmosphere and to the right you're seeing the corrected image of the star so the adaptive optics technique helps you to concentrate the light that is coming from the star which is distorted due to the earth's um, atmosphere due to the turbulence into the earth's atmosphere into a smaller region and hence giving you a much better spatial resolution so that is what adaptive optics um, actually enables you to do and adaptive optics is something that is uh, these days very commonly used on most of the large telescopes as i mentioned earlier um, a very important component of an observatory in addition to the telescope are these astronomical instruments and there are a variety of them that uh, one uses for um, <clears throat> estimating the magnitudes or the intensity for uh, studying the morphology of the various uh, astronomical sources the spectrometers give you spectral information which in turn provide you physical conditions of the source that one is observing the polarimeters and help you um, understand the polarization properties of the light that we are receiving um, for extremely high spatial resolution we use um, interferometers and if one wants to detect faint features around very bright objects then you use a technique uh, called the, the coronagraphs which um, actually blocks off the central bright source and uh, that will help you detect faint features so these are some of the very generic um, kind of instruments that one uses or one can use a variant of these uh, generic instruments now the first um, um astronomical use of a telescope was by galileo as most of you would know and this was in the year 1609 from then on there has been a, a fantastic progress in the technology and in the use of the telescopes and as the you know the technological uh, progress happened there's been tremendous amount of scientific advancement also so we have had a steady increase in the light gathering part and in the resolving part of the telescopes uh, new techniques like active and adaptive optics have been put in place interferometry and combining of light uh, using several telescopes are uh, being done so today the um, largest telescopes are uh, the 10 meter class telescopes and in the coming decade or so the future is going to be dominated by these 20 to 30 meter uh, class telescopes now coming to the astronomical um, observatories within uh, uh, india itself there are um, uh, quite a few of them and uh, here we, i have listed out uh, the various optical observatories that we have um we have uh, radio um, observatories that um, help us study these objects in the radio region and we also have um, a space uh, observatory um which enables us to study these objects in the x ray and in the um, ultraviolet uh, regions so let me go over a little more in detail um, into uh, some of these um, observatories i'll first begin with the venubapu um, observatory which is um, operated by the institute of astrophysics it is uh, located in uh, tamil nadu about 175 km southeast of uh, bangalore 
This observatory was established in the late uh, 1960s. Um, in fact, the first science observation from this observatory was done in the year 1968. There are three main telescopes here in addition to a few other smaller telescopes. Um, the largest that is um, available in uh, the Venubapu Observatory is the 2.3 meter Venubapu telescope. This uh, telescope was completely built in India, indigenously built in India, and it was uh, commissioned in the year 1986 and has been in use since 1986. This has got a, a 2.3 meter uh, primary uh, with a focal uh, ratio of 3.25. And it has a Cassegrain focus um, where the instruments are located. So the main instruments are for uh, spectroscopy. Um, we have a low resolution spectrograph at the Cassegrain focus. And um, there is a fiber fed uh, high resolution spectrograph where the light is taken from the prime focus. The fiber feed is from the uh, prime focus. The other one, the one meter Zeiss telescope, this was actually the first um, telescope, the, the first large, quote unquote, large telescope which came um, in this observatory. This was um, established in the early 1970s and has been in use since then. Uh, this has, in addition to uh, spectroscopic capabilities, uh, it has um, an instrument which helps us measure the polarization of uh, the light. A newer addition, uh, about um, <clears throat> close to 10 years now, is the 1.3 meter uh, telescope. Uh, this has got a wide uh, field of view as compared to the other two uh, systems there. Uh, it's got a 30 arc minute uh, corrected field and it is um, equipped with um, CCD uh, imaging capabilities. So, I, yeah. so this is a very short movie showing the panoramic view. What you see in the front is a 1.3 meter, right at the behind is a 2.3 meter Vainubapu telescope. And the one which is just passing by, that is the, the 40 inch or the one meter uh, telescope. And you can also see there are some smaller um, domes which are popping up here. The other observatory is the Indian Astronomical Observatory. This is also operated by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. This is located at a high altitude site in, the, in Ladakh at an altitude of 4,500 meters in uh, Hanle. <clears throat> it's an extremely good site um, as far as astronomical sites in India are concerned. Uh, probably one of the best, got about 260 clear nights per year and uh, it has a median seeing of one arc second, that is the atmospheric turbulence is uh, good but not as good as some of the best sites in the world. So currently it sites a two meter um, telescope which is called as the Himalayan Chandra telescope and there is also a smaller uh, robotic telescope uh, the 0.7 meter uh, Growth India Telescope. These two are located at the mountain top, and uh, the the picture here shows uh, these two telescopes, the domes of the the two meter um, Himalayan Chandra Telescope and the 0.7 meter uh, GIT Telescope. At the base, there are uh, uh, facilities for observations in the gamma ray, the high altitude gamma ray array um, telescope, which is um, uh, it is an array of um, uh, small telescopes, each of um, 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 one meter, a, a combination of seven uh, small telescopes and an array of uh, seven such telescopes. And um, there is also a 22 meter imaging Cherenkov uh, telescope, which is currently under uh, installation. A unique feature about this observatory is that the observatory is entirely powered by solar power. And um, so we call this as, as a green observatory. It is green as opposed to the greenery that you saw in the panoramic view of the Venubapu observatory. That is green for its pre-cover, whereas this is green for using clean energy. So a little more de uh, detail on the Himalayan Chandra telescope. 
Uh, it's got a two meter aperture uh, primary, and it has an instrument queue where on which uh, we can mount four instruments, uh, five actually we have uh, with four side ports and one on axis port. And the advantage of having this configuration is that you have the science instruments available um, all the time. And uh, the, the main uh, science instruments which are mounted and available all the time are um, an uh, optical um, spectrograph camera, which has both um, imaging and spectroscopic capability. Um, <clears throat> and then a similar um, system for um, imaging and doing spectroscopy in the 0.9 to 2.5 micron range, that is the near infrared range. And it also has um, an instrument which will allow us to get um, um, spectra with a much higher resolution than uh, what the, the other instrument, the HFOSC instrument can give. So the advantage of um, having such a configuration is that in a given night, um, an object can be observed in both the optical region and in the, in the near infrared region. So you can have nearly simultaneous multivalent observations of a given uh, ob um, object. And this is particularly um, very important for uh, transient um, objects. A unique feature of this uh, uh, telescope is that the telescope, the dome, and the instruments are all controlled remotely uh, from our IAA's uh, uh, campus in Hoskote. So, uh, and this is done through a dedicated uh, a satellite link. So people, the observers don't necessarily have to go all the way to Hanley for the observations. They don't have to be there at you know high altitude with low oxygen content, extremely cold, dry desert area, but they can do all their observations comf sitting comfortably near Bangalore. So this is a major advantage of this telescope. Uh, this um, observatory was started in 1998. Uh, the two-meter telescope was um, saw first light in 2001. And for 20 years, it has been in um, continuous operation. A more recent um, addition to uh, the observatory in Hanley has been this 2.7 meter uh, wide field telescope. It's got a 0.7 degree field of view, and it is a, it's a robotic telescope. So uh, the, the wide field actually helps us in um, the transient observations, particularly in detecting the, the counterparts of the gravitational wave sources, the optical counterparts of the gravitational wave sources. This was installed in uh, uh, June 2018. And uh, this telescope was funded as a part of an international um, collaboration called uh, GROWTH. Uh, it was funded by uh, the Department of Science and Technology uh, the Science and Engineering uh, Research Board. <clears throat> and uh, as I said, this is a part of an um, uh, international project to study transients, um, the EM counterparts of uh, gravitational wave sources in particular. So this is a panoramic view of the um, IAO. You can see the mountain top, a closer view of the uh, HCT dome, an inside view of the telescope itself, showing you the, the telescope and uh, the instruments as they are mounted. You can see the HFOSC and the infrared uh, camera. Um, these are the ones at the Cassegrain focus. And at a uh, room below, we have this high resolution spectrograph. Uh, this is the 0.7 meter Growth India uh, telescope. Um, these are the ones at mountain top. This is the Hagar uh, array for the gamma ray at the base. And um, you can now see the major atmospheric Cherenko experiment maze telescope, uh, which is a combination of 356 one square meter metal mirrors. And it has a photomultiplier to imaging uh, camera at its uh, focus. And this is currently being installed. This is general view at the base and uh, the mountain top. Mountain top, it's 
is 500 meters, whereas the base is 4,200 meters. The other um, observatory is uh, the um, Aryabhata, the one operated by the Aryabhata Research Institute, Observational Sciences, ARES. Um, this actually started off as the Uttar Pradesh uh, State Observatory. It is located on Manora Peak at uh, Nainital. Uh, it was established in the early 1970s with a one meter telescope, again, a Carl Zeiss telescope, which is very similar to the one meter telescope at um, the Vanuvapu Observatory. In fact, both these, um, the, the person responsible for bringing both these one meter telescopes to India was uh, Professor M.K. Vainubapu, who was the director of uh, UPSO prior to his moving over and um, becoming the director of the Kodakana Observatory and setting up the Vainubapu Observatory. ARIES operates the Devastal uh, Observatory. It's a fairly new um, uh, establishment. <coughs> The largest telescope there is a 3.6 meter Devastal optical telescope. In fact, uh, this is the largest telescope uh, in the country today. And uh, this has um, capabilities for uh, imaging in the optical um, in, and uh, the near infrared. Uh, it has capabilities for uh, low resolution spectroscopy, uh, high resolution uh, spectroscopy and um, um, some of the instruments are under development. Uh, currently, what is available is the imaging capabilities and the low resolution capabilities. Devastal also has a 1.3 meter uh, telescope, again from the same company that um, uh, from which the 1.3 meter telescope in Kavlur was purchased. And Devastal also has a four meter liquid mirror telescope that is currently under installation. Um, this is a, a, a unique um, uh, facility because it does not use um, mirrors, but it uses um, mercury as um, uh, the, the, the mirror in liquid form. Okay. And um, because you have this liquid mirror, it, it cannot point to all directions in the sky. So it is just pointing straight upward. And hence, this is a transit um, a telescope, which is going to be used for a uh, survey of the sky as it passes um, over the, the telescope. The, the Mount Abu Observatory is operated by the Physical Research Laboratory. It has a 1.2 meter telescope, which is optimized for the near infrared region. And this telescope has been functional since uh, the late uh, 1994. Um, at uh, the same location, a 2.5 meter telescope is going to be established. The telescope is um, fabricated in uh, the AMOS in uh, Belgium. And the back-end instruments for the telescope are being developed by the Physical Research Laboratory. Um, again, this will have capabilities for high-resolution spectroscopy and you know, high-precision uh, spectroscopy and imaging capabilities and uh, polarimetric capabilities. So the, the um, telescope and the dome is currently under uh, construction. And hopefully, in a year's time, this telescope will be commissioned. Um, the other um, uh, optical um, observatory is that operated by Ayuka, the Giravali Observatory. This also has a two meter telescope with uh, spectroscopic and uh, polarimetric uh, capabilities. Ayuka is also a partner in the Southern African Large Telescope called um, also abbreviated to SALT. Uh, this has an 11 meter um, primary mirror, the diameter is uh, 11 meters. And this primary consists of 91 uh, hexagonal mirrors of uh, one meter size. Uh, this has uh, the um, capability for, um, again, for observations, spectroscopic observations in optical and in near infrared and uh, high time resolution uh, images in the optical and a deep sky uh, imaging camera.
So through Ayuka, Indian astronomers have uh, some access uh, to this telescope. Coming to the other uh, regions, uh, apart from the optical and near infrared, um, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you would be knowing about the giant meter wave radio telescope, which is operated by the National Center for Radio Astrophysics in Pune. <clears throat> the telescope itself is uh, located close to uh, Narangga. And it consists of 30, 45 meter diameter antennas, which are spread over 25 kilometers. Um, half the antenna are uh, in a very compact uh, area, which is a randomly distributed array within a diameter of about one kilometer. The remaining um, antenna are on three arms uh, of length 14 kilometer with about five to six antenna in uh, each arm. So the longest baseline this telescope has is uh, 26 kilometers and the shortest is 100 meters. GMRT operates um, in the meter wave uh, region at uh, 150 megahertz, 235 megahertz, 325 megahertz, 610 and 1420 megahertz. NCRA also operates a telescope in uh, UTI, the oldest radius telescope in the country. Uh, which operates in 326.5 uh, uh, megahertz. And uh, this telescope is being primarily used to study uh, pulsars. Uh, coming to India's um, uh, space mission, the, um, the Space uh, Observatory, Astronomical Observatory, the AstroSat. The AstroSat has, as I mentioned earlier, um, instruments for observing in the X-ray and in the ultraviolet in range of X-rays, ranging all the way from the hard X-ray to the soft X-ray. AstroSat was launched in uh, 2015, in September 2015 from Sriharikota using the PSLV launch engine. Uh, for the ultraviolet observations, uh, it has two um, twin 38 centimeter uh, telescopes, which cover all the way from the far UV to the optical bands, that is uh, roughly uh, 1300 nanometers to about um, 5000 uh, angstroms, uh, 1300 angstroms to uh, 5000 angstroms. It's got a fairly wide field of view, uh, about uh, 28 arc minutes, and uh, is, uh, the telescope has a very good um, resolution probably the best uh, spatial resolution as far as ultraviolet uh, telescopes of its size uh, go. Um, for the X-ray uh, region, covering the, the hard X-ray region from 3 to 80 uh, keVs, there are three uh, proportional counters, large area xenon proportional uh, counters, um, as you can see marked in the, the cartoon to the right. And... Uh, there's a soft X-ray uh, telescope, which covers a range of 0.3 to 8 um, uh, keV. Uh, there is also a cadmium zinc telluride coded mask imager, or the CZTI, which covers in the hard X-ray region all the way from the 10 to 150 keV. And this has got a fairly wide field of view, about 6 degree field. And uh, this instrument has been um, um, particularly effective in in detecting the gamma ray burst sources, the, the X-ray um, emission from the gamma ray, gamma ray burst uh, sources. There's also a scanning sky monitor, um, which consists of uh, three one-dimensional position sensitive proportional counters. And uh, these are um, particularly useful to locate um, uh, transient sources in the X-ray. So to summarize, um, these are the suite of um, um, instruments, the telescopes and uh, observatories that one has in the country to, you know, these are the country's optical eyes. And in the other wavelength regions, you have the GMRT in the radio, uh, the MACE for the TV gamma rays, which is coming up. It's almost there. And then we have the AstroSat, uh, which is enabling us to study in the X-rays and in the ultraviolet uh, regions. So what is um, 
for example, gravitational wave science uh, require. It requires multi-wavelength and multi-messenger uh, astronomy. So what do we have currently? We have one to four meter class optical telescopes. Um, most of them being narrow field, except probably the 0.7 meter uh, GIT, which has got the wide field. We have the GMRT for low frequency radio observations. And we have the AstroSat for X-ray and UV uh, observations. But to be competitive internationally, what is it that we require? It's not that we are not you know, internationally um, competitive. We are, but to be even better than what we are today, we require a large optical near-infrared telescope. We require radio capabilities in the, in the higher uh, radio frequencies. <clears throat> and as we know, all space missions have a limited time. It's five years since AstroSat has been launched. And so it is time for us to look at new space missions, which will help us continue our observations in the X-ray, in the ultraviolet, and probably in the gamma rays too. So what is it that we are doing for this? For the gravitational waves itself, we have, we'll be having the LIGO India in the next few decades, uh, in the next decade, and beyond that when it is in operation. And you all, I mean, there have been talks on LIGO India, so I'm not going to detail on that. For the optical infrared region, India is partnering with the 30 meter telescope project which is an international project. Um, the partners are uh, <clears throat> the California Institute of Technology and the universities of California, Canada, Japan, China, and India. These are the uh, current partners. The telescope uh, itself will be a wide field altazimuth ritchie Cridian telescope. It, the primary is a 30 meter uh, diameter primary consisting of 492 hexagonal segments with each hexagon being 1.44 meter across the columns. It will have an active secondary and it will have a flat tertiary beam which will deflect the light to the Nasmith focus that is to the, the focus which is at the side of the telescope tube. The instruments itself, there'll be about eight instruments, and these will be located on the two uh, NASMIT uh, platforms. So essentially, all these eight instruments will be available for use um, all the time. And this will cover the, the entire range, all the way from the optical, that is a visible range, to the mid-infrared regions. And this will be equipped with um, adaptive optics, to enable uh, high spatial resolution um, observations. So India's share is about um, 10%. And India is also uh, contributing uh, to the hardware and the, the software uh, to the telescope. <clears throat> it's contributing to the, uh, the primary mirror control system and the uh, primary um, mirror and the observatory uh, control software. Um, we will be delivering a part of the primary mirror segments, about 80 um, segments, uh, polishing about 80 segments here in the country. We are contributing to the, the development of the, the instruments, and uh, we will also be building the, the coating chambers, that is the, the vacuum chambers, which are used to, the, to coat the, the mirrors, the glass uh, with the reflective uh, coating. Likewise, all the partners are uh, involved in the delivery of various components. So uh, this is going to be um, a combination of hardware and software, which is you know, being developed across all these nations um, across the globe, a, a truly international uh, partnership coming together to have a state-of-the-art telescope. We expect the telescope to be um, 
really in the mid um, 30s 2030s and um, so in the in the coming uh, decades um, we'll be having this telescope for use for the for the indian astronomers so so it is for all the young population the young eager astronomers who are looking to come into this field you have an extremely bright future ahead in terms of the capabilities that um, india will be able to offer to you where it is going to be located a um, preferred site is monakia in uh, hawaii we also have an um, alternate site uh, which is in the canary islands um, of spain called uh, la palma so it will be sited in, uh, in one of these um, locations uh just a few um features what is unique about this this is going to have extremely high resolution uh spatial resolution which is going to be 10 times that of the hubble space telescope and about 5 times that of the 6 meter uh, james webb telescope it will have extremely um high sensitivity a high performance adaptive optics system which will provide uh you know very good angular resolution so what does this angular resolution enable us to do it essentially will help us resolve small objects as small as 25 km in size on the jupiter's surface so it's going to be you know uh, it's going to have such a good um, resolving power so uh, potentially the 30 meter telescope will be um, 14 times better if you are looking at the seeing limited that is with the earth's uh, turbulence affecting the light that is coming or 400 times more sensitive 400 times if you are using the adaptive optics which is going to correct for the earth's uh, turbulence and concentrate the light so once you have it in the concentrated mode it's going to be 400 times more sensitive than the current 8 to 10 meter class telescopes so this essentially means that 29 on the 30 meter telescope will be equivalent to a whole year so observations on the current largest telescopes we have and there are going to be three such telescopes which are again um, all three of them international uh, partnerships and india is participating in one of them that is the 30 meter telescopes so in the coming decade and from then on we are going to have three large telescopes 20 to 30 meter um, in size for the radio region the, the square kilometer um, array which is coming up which is going to have arrays of different kinds and this uh, pictorial representation of the different kinds of arrays so this will um, enable studies in the radio regions all the way from the very low frequencies to the very high frequencies india is partnering um, in this project too so this will bridge the gap in the radio frequencies that currently we do not have facilities in the country for the observations in the high uh, radio frequencies for the ultraviolet um, a new mission has been um, proposed so this will be a wide field uh, ultraviolet equivalent to the uh, hubble space telescope it will have imaging and spectroscopic uh, capabilities currently the the design study is um, going on and uh, we hope to be funded to actually you know make this instrument and launch it in about a decades um i talked about the 30 meter uh, telescope but i also told you that currently the largest we have in the country is a 3.6 meter telescope so it's a huge jump for us from the 3.6 meter to the 30 meter so we definitely need a 10 meter class telescope in the country there's certainly a very strong need for having this uh, a 10 meter class telescope in the country for us to generate science for the larger telescopes to train the young astronomers to be able to use the 30 meter telescope 
So a proposal has been uh, submitted to seek funding for this. And on the side, there have been some design studies which are going on. And if funded, this will also come um, a little after, maybe a little after the 30 meter telescope. By our participation in the 30 meter telescope, we are gaining a lot of uh, experience. We're getting a lot of uh, uh, technology that is coming into the country. And with that, we will be able to actually make this 10 meter telescope entirely in the country. And we're hoping to be funded for this. So we should be having a range of um, observing facilities in the optical and infrared uh, regions in the 2030s and beyond that. And for the X-ray, um, another mission has been proposed called the Daksha, which will be particularly useful for um, observing high energy uh, transients. And this is an all sky um, survey mission. So this is another um, <clears throat> proposal that has been seeded for the initial uh, studies. And uh, hopefully this will also be launched. Uh, again, this is, this is on a shorter time scale, maybe in the next five to six years. And so this should be online when the, the next LIGO run um, happens. So with this, I have given you an overview of the various facilities we have. Uh, currently for doing astronomy in the country and um, what we have in the future. Of course, what I have not touched upon here is the facilities that we have for uh, solar observations. We do have a um, good number of facilities for solar observations from the ground and uh, very soon there will be um, a space borne facility for uh, solar observations. Solar astronomy in India is the oldest uh, form of astronomy, you can say. And uh, the, the oldest solar observatory is located in Kodaikanal, which is over 100 years old. And uh, the data of um, oh, the sun, the you know, full um, image, disk image of the sun is available at this observatory for all these 100 years. And this data have all been digitized and currently they're available for use by any astronomer. So with this, I will stop my um, talk and um, I think I can take um, questions. Let me just... I'm just looking at the questions. Okay, so there is a question here which says that um, by Amoga Varsha, um, can studying microwaves give us more insights into GW um, astronomy? As I uh, mentioned in the very beginning, um, it is over the entire electromagnetic um, range that you will get useful information from because um, each region is telling you something different. Um, it is looking at a slightly different physical uh, condition. So um, each wavelength region or each um, you know, electromagnetic region is, is probing a, a different um, part of these um, sources. Okay. And um, not just the, the electromagnetic spectrum, what I uh, also said is the multi-messenger astronomy. So uh, you know, even the detection of neutrinos is another thing which can uh, you know provide us information. So it is it is over the entire range, not just microwaves alone. Okay, so the entire range will give you tremendous insight into um, these sources. Okay, Kiran Mehta wants to know. 
as to why a whole campus is needed to use HCT. Okay. Um, the campus is the institute. Okay. And why is an institute needed? A research institute? I mean, you, you need a working place for the scientists, right? So that's where you're having the campus. And you need the observatory. Yeah, the, the observatory will have, apart from the telescope, it will have various other um, auxiliary facilities. And uh, the observatories are generally, uh, you know, much larger than this, uh, the place required for a single telescope for future development. And it's also better to have um, a surrounding area about the observatory, which is well protected from light pollution and from various other you know, man-made pollution from development. If there's a lot of development very close to the observatory, obviously they're going to lose the night sky, right? So that's why we need a whole campus. And the, the Crest campus is not just for um, observing with the HCT. It has various other facilities. It has a facility for integration of the space payloads, um, and uh, a new facility has been developed there for polishing the mirrors for the 30 meter telescope. So a campus enables you to expand, to do a lot of R&D, and to innovate. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, Ayushi is asking what advantages does the liquid mirror telescope has over conventional reflecting telescopes? Um, there's no major advantage. I think it's just a novel uh, concept. Um, it's cheap, but it has, uh, you know, associated disadvantages in the sense that um, it doesn't give you an all sky coverage. Um, it only allows a narrow path of um, the sky to be observed as it is transiting over the telescope. But it's a, it's a, it's a novel idea and it is um, relatively cheaper than a conventional telescope that is being used. Okay. Um, Kiran Mehta is asking, has adaptive plus active optics technologies rendered Optical space telescopes redundant. Um, okay, the way I would answer is that um, uh, the, the kind of spatial resolution with adaptive optics that get one gets with a larger telescope. Now, if you were to want a similar spatial resolution with a space telescope, It'll have to be of a larger uh, diameter than, uh, for example, in the, the six meter. And the cost of a six meter space telescope is definitely larger than um, the ground based optical telescopes. So, if you're talking about redundancy, I, I mean, they, they have their own use. Um, Particularly in the in the infrared uh, region, space telescopes are required because the Earth's atmosphere does not, I mean, it does not enable you to observe in the far infrared region. For that, you have to go to space. And uh, again, in the ultraviolet region, the Earth's atmosphere does not allow you to observe. In the X-ray region, it does not allow you to observe. So we do need space telescopes. Okay. What do we mean by EM equivalent? Okay, um, what I mean by EM equivalent, uh, sorry to have used acronyms. Um, now, when you have a, um, the, the gravitational waves are um, observed from sources which have merged, okay, like black holes or neutron stars. So the gravitational binding energy 
of these merging events are released as gravitational wave sources. Associated with this merger events, you will have radiation which is coming out due to this merger event. Okay? And that radiation is seen in the electromagnetic region. So what I mean by EM is the electromagnetic region. So, so we call these the, the source which is giving this radiation associated with the gravitational wave uh, event, merger event, which gave rise to the gravitational wave uh, waves as the EM counterpart of gravitational wave events. Okay, there are some uh, general questions. Maybe I can take a, a couple of them. Um, there is Ranjit Kumar from Jammu and would like to know whether they can visit the observatory at uh, Hanle. Yes, certainly you can visit the um, observatory. And uh, what knowledge can students gain from the visit? Uh, well, they, they get to see the telescope. They get to see the beautiful night sky. If they're staying there. And, um, and we will certainly explain the working of the, the telescope and uh, in a general way, the science that um, is being um, pursued. So uh, certainly you are welcome to visit the observatory. Um, any of the observatories, in fact, we encourage visits by um, students and also the general public. Um, somebody wants to know where in India are the software for TMT being scripted. Uh, this is um, a, this is a collaborative effort by the the research um, uh, institutes and um, um, some of our industry uh, partners. So this is happening in both Pune and uh, Bangalore. So, okay, then ah, this is uh, Siddharth Pad is asking, how can an electronics engineer or applied science graduates take part in the research at these astronomical facilities? This is a very good question. Uh, there are two ways in which um, uh, the engineers can take part. One is in the actual build um, of the telescopes and the instruments obviously this cannot be done without um, engineers and this is applicable to um, variety of branches in engineering electronics electrical mechanical um, civil computers um, even those from information technology because the the large amount of data which comes you know the, the uh, data handling capabilities so uh, engineers can take part in, in the actual development of the instruments. And of course, engineers can also do the science. Okay? It's not that um, only people with a physics background can do the science. There are several engineers who are you know, doing actual research in um, astronomy. But none of the facilities would be there without the engineering capability. So engineering capability is extremely important. Optical engineering, um, electrical, electronics, mechanical, civil, IT, computers, everything. All areas of engineering are extremely important for any observatory, not just in the build, subsequently in the operations and in the maintenance of these observatories. Um, there is another question, which is, I think, uh, quite relevant. And this is, what are the PhD options available in telescope design and requisites for the PhD programs? Okay. So, um, there, there are, um, you know, places which do offer PhDs in uh, optics. 
particularly for uh, you know uh, astronomical instrumentation iia has an integrated um, mtech phd program wherein we take um, students with uh, b or b tech background and uh, this program is run uh, in collaboration with the calcutta uh, university so <clears throat> um, you do an mtech you get an mtech degree in um, um, astronomical instrumentation and then uh, you can go on to do a phd uh, primarily related to the developmental um, activities um, there have been students who have been involved in uh, design aspects of telescopes particularly the segmented mirror telescopes as a precursor to the proposed uh, 10 meter um, indian telescope and there are also students who have been uh, who have got phd's being involved in certain aspects of the the 30 meter um, you know telescope um, aspects of the indian contribution to the 30 meter uh, telescope so um, yes i has a, a phd program for this area um there's a question which says have there been any proposals for optical telescope arrays to bring down cost of sing large single mirrors um i would answer it in the sense of the proposed uh, 10 meter telescope which is um, a segmented um, mirror primary so instead of a single mirror a large single mirror um the proposal is to have um multiple segments and uh, something to the tune of um, 60 to 70 um, segments yeah so um it's it's not easy to make a a single uh, mirror large mirror and uh, you know the making these mirror blanks are um, uh, done by very few companies or maybe just uh, two or three companies across the world and currently you know there is the capable the largest uh, single blank which the for which the capability exists is about 8 um, to 9 meters not larger than that okay? and these are quite expensive so it makes better sense to have um, segmented mirrors as you're going to larger uh, diameters so yeah i guess um, we have crossed the time so maybe i can uh, conclude with this um and i thank you all for being here and uh, listening to my talk i hope i have inspired you know a good fraction of you to come into the field of astronomy thank you <laughs>